everyone, it's Mark from Oika, and yeah, that doesn't suck, right? Right now, I am in Yame, and this is one of the most uh, famous growing regions. It's scenic. Actually, there's a ton of people here that are like watching me record videos. It's a little embarrassing, but hey, it is what it is. I wanted to come here to do this video about L-theanine. It's what gives matcha the savory taste. It's also what makes you feel calm. And a lot of people talk about matcha really focusing in on individual chemicals, caffeine or L-theanine or the antioxidants, zooming in and hyper-focusing like we do on the West on a compound. Let's clear up what really is L-theanine? What does it do to you when you drink it? What does it taste like and why should we care about any of that? Okay, so first off, what is L-theanine? L-theanine is an amino acid. It's in tea. It's in fact the most present amino acid. It represents 6% of the dry weight of the tea bush, at least in the root structure. Pointing over here because there's a tea plant. L-theanine is notable because there are three elements of it that we care about as far as people who drink matcha. Number one, it contributes to the savory and sweet taste that we call umame in the tea plant. And by the way, this isn't just matcha and it isn't just Japanese tea plants. L-theanine is in all tea plants. Two, it gets in your brain and causes non-placebo effects, such as a calming effect. And three, it's a bioactive compound. In other words, it's good for you. Now the amount of L-theanine in your uh, cup or bowl of matcha, it varies, but the amount of L-theanine that you can typically find in a bowl of matcha is anywhere from four to 40 milligrams per gram. So how important really is L-theanine to the, let's say, quality of matcha? If we have a bowl of matcha and it has more L-theanine, is it a higher quality matcha? Well, frankly, yes. In fact, there are people who have said that you can rank the quality of matcha with the amount of L-theanine in it. The more L-theanine, the more savoriness you're gonna have. This is a very prized element of Japanese tea, especially with matcha. But also you can tell the quality by the amount of certain catechins, which are astringent tasting antioxidants, them being in low amounts in your tea, specifically EC and EGC. We're gonna take a little break here so I can show you guys the Beautiful view. Here is your typical tea bush, and at the bottom there, you can see the root structure. Well, that's actually the trunk, but down there are the roots, and that is where the L-theanine uh, is actually produced. A lot of information on L-theanine is incomplete or sometimes just misinformed because a lot of the research for L-theanine happened here in Japan in the 1960s and 1970s, and they were published in Japanese journals, scientific journals. Most of that just didn't make it to the West. There wasn't really a reason. In the 1960s and 1970s, how many people were really drinking matcha in the USA? On top of that, L-theanine is really only found in tea. There apparently is some mushroom species that has a little L-theanine, but it's pretty specific to the tea plant. 1949, Yojiro Sakato is the one who discovered L-theanine in the tea plant. And it was a special type of tea called Gyokoro. Gyokoro is a tea that is similar to matcha. It's part of the cultivation process. When they grow it, they actually cover the bushes with a type of shading. That shading results in more L-theanine in the tea, and Gyokoro and matcha have the most because they're the teas that are shaded. Well, there are others, but they're the two most well-known Japanese teas that are shaded. Now, where things get really interesting is over generations, over time, the connoisseurs of the past recognized that tea grown in certain regions tasted better than tea grown in other regions. This concept we know as terroir. It's the same reason that some regions in France produce better wine than other regions in France and across the world. But here's where things get really interesting. Not only did we recognize that certain growing areas had better tasting tea, we realized that there were shared traits between the best growing regions. Now these shared commonalities between the best growing regions in China, well, there's a bunch of them, but I'm gonna focus on the three that are relevant for this video. Number one, the best growing regions in China for tea, back then and today, they're steep inclined growing regions as opposed to flat land. Best areas for tea cultivation happen to be areas that were very foggy. And finally, we realized that the best place to grow your tea, if you have a mountain, is going to be the south, the east, or the southeast face. Those produce slightly better tea than the west and the north side of the mountain. The finest tea reveals itself on high cliffs and jagged boulders, lush with forest and thick with cloud. 
Now, as you could probably guess, based on the context of this video, these growing conditions increase the amount of L-theanine in the tea plant. The Japanese, without knowing what L-theanine was, started covering their tea plants, resulting in tea that had more savory elements because of increased L-theanine. So tea does in fact taste better to us when it has higher levels of L-theanine. But the question is, why? Why do tea plants actually produce L-theanine and how is it done? Now this is a little bit complex, so I'm going to nutshell the process. The root structure of tea plants naturally produces L-theanine. It does this in response to ammonia, which is one of the primary sources of nitrogen in fertilizer for the tea plant. There is a point where too much fertilizer will actually hurt the plant. L-theanine then travels up the roots, up into the leaves via the xylem sap. One once in the leaf and exposed to sunlight, the plant begins to break down the L-theanine, both into glutamic acid and ethylamine. The important point here is that the more sunlight that hits the leaf, the more of the theanine is broken down. Uh, the technical term for that is hydrolyzed. Here is my favorite part. Once the tea plant begins to break down the L-theanine, the savory tasting L-theanine, into the ethylamine, the plant then uses the ethylamine in the leaf to biosynthesize catechins. By the way, how's that sunset? Not bad, right? I know that's a lot of science guy talk, but here's why that matters as far as connoisseurship and the taste of the tea itself. L-theanine is savory. It's what we want in tea because it's what is one of the characteristics of a high quality tea. Once the savoriness gets into the leaf, when the leaf gets hit with sunlight, the plant then converts it into catechins, which are astringent tasting antioxidants. When it comes to drinking a bowl of matcha, we want as low as possible catechins and high as possible alphenine. What this means is the more sunlight that hits our plant, the more bitter and astringent it tastes and the less savory because the savoriness, because the savoriness is literally broken down to create the astringency. It's built from the savoriness. <laughs> So what determines the amount of L-theanine in the tea plant? Well, it is partially environmental and partially it is genetic. We can also call that the cultivar, just like you have a red apple versus a green apple. The sweetness is kind of within a range that's pre-programmed. The type of tea plant has a pre-programmed, let's say, genetic potential for the amount of savoriness it can achieve. Next is the cultivation technique. We can increase the amount of L-theanine in our tea plant by fertilizing it, covering it, shading it, things like that. And finally is the category of tea that we manufacture it into. All tea comes from the same plant, but we can choose to make different types of teas, categories of teas from it. We can make green tea, white tea, yellow tea, oolong tea, we can make red tea, we can make black tea. So whatever type of tea we make will affect the final amount of L-theanine in the brew. Simply put, the more oxidized the tea, the less amount of L-theanine will be in the final brew. So how does L-theanine actually affect us? How does it affect our brain chemistry? In a nutshell, it makes us feel more relaxed. It increases the amount of alpha brain activity, alpha brain waves, which we associate with more creativity, with relaxation. I do want to say that when it comes to matcha, most people drink it for the health reasons in the West. The health benefits of matcha are probably the least interesting element about it. The connoisseurship, the taste, the flavor, the stories, the farms, the terroirs, that's where the mystery and the romance and all of the excitement is for me. But yes, the health benefits are there and they are worth covering for a video such as this. Now, the reason that L-theanine is good for us and the reason it affects us in a positive way is because when L-theanine gets into your brain, it helps produce a number of elements that we like in our brain, such as dopamine, serotonin, as well as an acid called GABA, which Google it yourself. All of this means that you feel good, you feel happy, you feel relaxed without feeling drowsy, which that one's a key too. Most interesting is the intersection between L-theanine and caffeine, because tea has both a stimulant and a relaxant. Together, you get that signature gentle euphoria that comes from drinking matcha without any hard crashes, without the negative jitters and effects of caffeine. They occur about 40 minutes after you drink your bowl of matcha. And that focused relaxation is the same feeling that made matcha popular with the Japanese monks that drank it a thousand years ago that caused them to bring it to Japan to begin with. Clinical research on L-theanine shows that it does a lot for us more than just making us feel relaxed. I'll read a little bit of a list. Anti-cancer potential, anti-anxiety potential, cardiovascular, anti-inflammatory, immune boosting, antiviral. And frankly, this list is so long, it's a little bit overwhelming to uh, even look at, let alone read through. But I'll put a link below to uh, one of the many articles uh, scientific backed up 
articles, meta-analysis on L-theanine and just how good it is for you. And remember, you're only getting it from matcha. Well, I've been racing to complete this video before it gets too dark. The sun has already set, but it's still in that blue hour, so I still look good on camera. But I think I'm gonna call the video here. I think at this point, we've given ourselves enough information. But remember, when it comes to drinking matcha, the elements in it, the individual compounds, are far less important than the sum of its parts. When we drink matcha, not only are we entering into a thousand years, generations of experience and stories and the air and the sky, but we become active participants in it. We become part of that story. There is real value in the scientific elements of matcha, like we said, but the meaning that's to be found in matcha is found in the art. So thanks for joining me. Again, I am Mark from Oika. If there's any topics on matcha or Japanese tea, but specifically matcha that you'd like me to cover in the future, be sure to let me know. And let's end with something beautiful. <laughs> Instead of having the camera pointed at my ugly face, look at this beautiful, beautiful field.